welcome to another episode of Untold Legends, where I take a deep dive into your favorite fictional stories. Last time on the Metroid Timeline and Retrospective series, I detailed how the incredible success of Metroid Prime led to the portable Prime-style experience, Metroid Prime Hunters. After saving the planet of Talon IV, the universe received a mysterious signal from another galaxy, promising the ultimate power. Samus was sent to claim the power or destroy it in a race against time as other hunters received the same message. When Samus arrived, she discovered the Tetra Galaxy's limbic civilization was obliterated by the monstrous entity, Gurria. She uncovered the truth behind the so-called ultimate power and confronted Gurria in an extra-dimensional final battle, ultimately destroying it and ensuring the same tragedy wouldn't be repeated elsewhere. Metroid Prime Hunters and Metroid Prime Pinball weren't the only games that followed in the footsteps of Prime, however. The idea for a true sequel was formulated during the final phase of the game's development, in a story treatment known as Metroid 1.5. Metroid 1.5 wasn't any kind of official plan for a Prime sequel, more of a document filled with story and gameplay ideas and concept art. This early version of the Prime sequel involved Samus receiving a distress signal from a huge alien ship traveling through a parallel dimension. The ship's AI had gone rogue, and it's on course to crash into a peaceful planet, with the goal of enslaving its people with the alien army aboard its ship. Samus was pulled into the ship in order to be captured and her abilities absorbed. This alien race dreamed of perfection. They traveled from planet to planet and assimilated technology to become more powerful. And Samus's Metroid 1.5 goals were to disable the ship's engines, destroy the AI, and destroy all life on the ship. Of course, the final version of the Metroid Prime sequel would end up being completely different. Nintendo officially greenlit the sequel and asked Retro Studios to develop it. This time around, the pressure was enormous to create a successful game. With the original Metroid Prime, Retro Studios was used to low expectations and concerns from critics since they were an unproven development studio. And the Metroid formula was getting a drastic overhaul, at the time a very controversial move. Now the game industry knew what Retro Studios was capable of, and fans everywhere expected a worthy follow-up. Retro Studios' development cycle was intense. They developed a new set of tools to work on the game to accelerate production. And no assets were reused, they recreated everything from scratch. Something not commonly done in the game industry when it comes to sequels. Assets are still to this day reused all the time. More cutscenes were added in compared to the first one to create a more story-based aspect to the experience. Instead of Metroids and Space Pirates being the main focus of the story while still present, they did take a backseat to something new. Like many other Nintendo characters, Samus finally received her own evil doppelganger in the form of Dark Samus. Metroid Prime 1 had some gigantic bosses that were much larger than Samus, and Retro Studios desired to create a threat that was the same size as her. They found inspiration for Dark Samus within Zero Mission, where Samus fights a sort of mirror image of herself during the final Chozo Ruins test. And over time, this evil Samus became one of the most iconic characters in the Metroid series, even making it into the Super Smash Bros. roster. As far as the actual plot, Retro Studios wanted a story that felt as if it were pushing and pulling you constantly, which evolved into the idea of traveling between a light world and dark dimension. If that concept does sound familiar to you, you've probably played The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past another groundbreaking Nintendo title. The developers even sought the advice of producers that were involved with A Link to the Past in order to incorporate a similar concept in Metroid. Other story elements drew inspiration from Hollywood, more specifically the sci-fi horror action classic Aliens. Samus is sent to re-establish contact with Galactic Federation troopers, similar to how the Colonial Marines are sent to re-establish contact with the LV-426 colony. The discovery of trooper bodies in a hive is similar to how the cocoon colonists are found in aliens, and another idea that was floated around was to have Samus suffering from memory loss, but that never made it into the final game. She did, however, receive some of her more familiar moves, such as the screw attack and wall jumping, moves that skipped the first game due to time constraints. An unlockable, fully playable version of Super Metroid was also planned, but once again due to time constraints, Retro Studios didn't have time to implement it. In fact, three months before Nintendo's completion deadline, only about 30% of the game was complete. Finishing development of the game, while still creating something different that still felt familiar, was incredibly difficult. According to Retro Studios president Michael Kelbaugh, I quote, 
we wanted to expand and add to the title, and not just slam out a sequel. Nintendo doesn't do things that way. And expanding Prime, they did. For the first time, a multiplayer component was added, a pretty basic mode with up to four player split screen, using the same mechanics as the main game. Pretty fun mode with a group of friends, although it did feel a little unnecessary. Since players were also now familiar with the Metroid Prime control scheme, Retro Studios decided to make the sequel a bit more difficult. As development came to a close, the sequel to Metroid Prime was officially titled Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. In 2004, a demo version was playable during Nintendo's Fusion Tour, a video game and rock music festival that they sponsored, and a special bonus disc that contained a Metroid Prime 2 Echoes demo was eventually bundled with the first game and Nintendo GameCube units. The hype machine for Echoes was in full swing until the game launched in North America on November 15th, 2004. Two separate worlds, one shadow, one light, where the difference between life and death is a few inches of metal. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, only for Nintendo GameCube, rated T for Teen. Much like the first entry in the Prime series, it was met with mostly critical acclaim. Many reviews stated that it was every bit as good as its predecessor, but it did have its fair share of criticisms as well. The higher difficulty for one became a talking point. Some of the boss fights felt very unforgiving, lasting way too long with multiple phases, and the environment was very difficult to follow. All criticisms that I actually agree with overall. Searching for the game's final secret keys felt more like a chore and made the ending portion of the game feel like a very padded experience. Thankfully, Retro Studios' original idea never came to fruition. One of their early ideas for the Dark World was to have it be a literal Dark World. Samus would have to navigate the environment with a spotlight to be able to see anything. But Retro Studios deemed it pretty much impossible to play. Regardless of any criticisms, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes was a commercial success. It sold 470,000 copies in North America alone in December 2004, and overseas in Japan at the time, it was the ninth best-selling game during its debut month with just over 16,000 copies sold. And that's the story of Echo's creation. Now let's get into the actual in-game story. And a quick disclaimer as always, don't treat this video as a gameplay walkthrough. You will be lost. Several gameplay elements are not in the proper order to create a smoother storytelling experience. And I'll also be using elements from the Metroid 2 manga titled Episode of Aether. The story is very much non-canon since it does involve characters and situations not found in the game at all or even mentioned but I will be using some of its elements to give the story of Aether a bit more life, flush it out a little bit more, give it a little bit more emotion. Having said that, welcome to the Metroid Timeline Part 5, Shadows of Aether. Talon 4 was cleared of Phazon and recovering at an impressive rate, quickly becoming an ecological paradise again, and Samus had returned from destroying Gurria in the Tetra Galaxy. But peace in the Milky Way was still elusive. The space pirates were still recovering from the destruction of the Zebes base and the disruption of Talon 4's Project Helix. They still desired to create a super soldier army of their own to take over the galaxy, but they were missing a crucial asset, Phazon, the mysterious substance that Samus was responsible for destroying. Space Pirate Science teams continuously scanned the galaxy for more Phazon readings and discovered similar traits from a planet located in the Dasha system, a planet known as Aether. Space Pirate High Command immediately dispatched science teams protected by elite commandos to the planet to establish a base and evaluate local Phazon resources. Although Aether was located in the outer limits of the galaxy, it was still within Galactic Federation space, and patrols regularly monitored the region, so stealth was immensely important. The Space Pirates successfully landed on Aether and began studying the planet. Their initial research concluded that the local population was peaceful, once they landed, they realized that Aether was much more dangerous than originally believed. 
the native life forms seem to be at war with one another. Strange types of shadowy, insect-like creatures that cause considerable damage to the space pirates also. In response, the space pirates sent a message requesting much-needed backup. High Command authorized additional combat troops and sent a frigate to Aether. The space pirate frigate, however, came into contact with a Galactic Federation patrol ship on the way, the GFS Tier. The Tier chased the space pirate ship all the way to Aether, both of them firing upon one another, sustaining critical damage in the planet's harsh atmosphere. Survivors from the space pirate ship made their way from the wreckage to the pirate base. Meanwhile, the surviving Galactic Federation troops surveyed the damage from their crash. The Marines were part of the Galactic Federation Marine Corps. Core Task Force Heracles, comprised of soldiers split into multiple teams that were both expert fighters and skilled engineers. It was determined that the tier was beyond repair. They gutted the ship and used its parts to build a compound to protect themselves until help arrived. Much of Task Force Heracles stayed at the compound while some of them began exploring and searching for the space pirates. Instead of space pirates, they found a new terror. The ship had crashed close to a hive of splinters, insect-like creatures native to Aether. They weren't very dangerous individually, but they tended to attack in massive groups that overwhelmed their prey in numbers. For days, the attacks on the marines continued. They planned to destroy the local hive, but more hives were discovered, and the marines feared that they were interconnected with one another. If one hive were destroyed, the others could take notice and descend upon them in massive numbers. At one point, one of the engineers attempted to repair the ship's engines, but failed. In Aether's unusual atmosphere, was scrambling the distress signal they were trying to send out. It seemed that Task Force Heracles was trapped in a fight for their lives. Food was running low, ammo was running low, and the Galactic Federation Marine numbers were dwindling. Some placed their hopes in Samus, the legendary bounty hunter that would arrive and save them. Others believed that her exploits were exaggerated fairy tales, tales of her destroying an entire planet filled with space pirates, and a small detachment of Task Force Heracles was sent to find help in an alien temple seen in the distance. If there were peaceful aliens living on the planet, perhaps they'd be located at the temple and could help. But time eventually caught up with the survivors at the compound. A massive swarm of splinters gathered and attacked. With such little ammo and numbers left, survival was almost impossible. Meanwhile, in another part of the galaxy, the Crest, a civilian transport and passenger ship filled with humans, was under assault from a space pirate raid. The Crest was taking casualties and requested emergency assistance. Space pirates were boarding the ship in huge numbers, led by a massive general covered in body armor. And suddenly, the space pirate ship felt a huge impact and smoke covered the area. The general's blood ran cold when the figure standing in the smoke became clear. It was Samus Aran, target number one of the space pirates. The accursed hunter, the armored warrior that toppled the great Ridley and Mother Brain. Without hesitation, Samus opened fire on the space pirate troops. Too many lives were at stake for her to hesitate. The space pirates barely had any time to react or defend themselves. During the chaos, they dropped two Gatling guns on the floor that Samus took the opportunity to equip and she unleashed a barrage of firepower on the remaining space pirates, with a powerful blast from her arm cannon annihilating the general. The space pirates were decimated, and the civilians on board looked upon Samus with awe, but she had to leave immediately. A Galactic Federation transmission was coming from her ship. The Federation lost contact with Task Force Heracles and hired Samus to locate and assist them. She received their last known coordinates from an uncharted world and prepared to travel there.
the atmosphere of Aether was unusual, constantly switching between a bright sunny sky and a lightning storm. But Samus's gunship was able to survive the intense landing. It suffered some damage, but it was already self-repairing. In the meantime, she would leave her ship in the safety of this isolated area and find the Marines, hopefully alive and well. On Aether, she discovered a world that reminded her strongly of Talon IV. It seemed capable of sustaining life, but at the same time felt empty and filled with history. Galactic Federation equipment and the remains of life forms she had never seen before were scattered everywhere. The Federation Marines were definitely here, and there were signs of a firefight. Multiple firefights. And just beyond, she came across a horrific sight. The Galactic Federation Marines of Task Force Heracles. Their bodies lifeless and strung up, with splinters feeding on them near the command center. The wounds inflicted on them were horrendous. Their armor ripped to shreds by the incredible force of the splinter claws. There was nothing she could do for them at this point, except scan their identities and ensure they were properly reported to the Galactic Federation as KIA. These men likely had families that needed closure, but something was wrong with Aether. The shadowy creatures that had attacked space pirates previously weren't limited to insects. The dead marines were walking and attacking Samus. Before opening fire, she scanned them and no life signs were detected. Their bodies were empty of any person, and some sort of dark biomass was controlling them. Samus opened fire on the marines. No sounds came from them, no pain was felt. Empty puppets being controlled by an unseen force. Once they were destroyed, her suit picked up energy signals that seemed strangely familiar. Similar to the Metroid Prime she fought on Talon IV, yet different. When she crossed through a nearby door, she looked up in absolute shock at the sight in front of her. Standing before Samus was... herself. Or at least something that looked just like her. Her scans detected elements of her old Phazon suit and Phazon, and she realized what she was looking at was the answer to the question she was left with after Talon IV. When she defeated the Metroid Prime inside the Impact Crater, it stole her Phazon suit as it was dying. Somehow, what was left of the Metroid Prime, her Phazon suit, and the Phazon substance itself fused together, and this dark Samus was born. But what did it want, and what was it doing here? Samus needed answers. Samus followed Dark Samus into some sort of dimensional anomaly, and she realized how careless she was to follow so quickly. Wherever the anomaly led had an incredibly toxic atmosphere, so much that it ate away at her suit quickly, and the creatures that surrounded her stole much of her weaponry and equipment. They had the same shadowy readings as the resurrected and zombified marines. And Phazon. Samus was sure she saw it. Dark Samus was more interested in the substance than it was in her. But how did Phazon get all the way here from Talon IV? She couldn't leave until the mystery was solved. Her new objectives were to retrieve her equipment and find out what was happening on Aether. And just outside, Samus looked upon the alien structures of the planet. It wasn't Chozo, but there were similarities. Just as ancient, and the environment was fused with technology. She found more Galactic Federation equipment scattered everywhere, and it was clear the Federation Marines were trying their best to send out a distress signal with multiple satellites, but the unusual atmosphere would never allow those transmissions to go through. And she found more Marines, deceased and slashed apart, just like the one she found before. This was the wreckage of the GFS tier. The soldiers had given it their all and went down fighting in the end. Around the hill near the wreckage, Samus also found the body of a creature she had never seen before, dead for a long time, before the marines had even arrived. And the body showed signs of the same type of wounds the marines had suffered. What drew her curiosity was the giant temple-like structure near the ship. Following the trail of bodies, it seemed like the marines were trying to get there and never made it past the splinter hive surrounding the area.
She cleared it of the creatures and the seemingly mutated one. It was now much safer than before, but Samus was confused about the mysterious ball of light that her suit absorbed. Nearby, she detected life forms. Could some of the Marines actually still be alive? She heard yelling in the distance, and a swarm of splinters traveled in a pack towards the noise. She blasted them apart with her arm cannon, and she saw someone wearing Galactic Federation Marine armor. It was a survivor. The group that was sent to investigate the temple were shaken, but four of them survived, led by a soldier named Miguel Garcia. They confirmed that nobody else was left. The entire crew of the GFS tier and Task Force Heracles was dead, with the exception of themselves, Team Bravo. Samus heard their story. Now that the area was clear of threats, they agreed to travel to the top of the enormous temple structure. Perhaps answers could be found there. Once they arrived, one of the same creatures Samus saw deceased outside presented itself. Miguel drew his firearm, but Samus quickly stopped him. It was possible this alien didn't pose a threat. Team Bravo stood back as Samus walked forward to meet it, and the alien spoke. I want to know about it. confirmed that he posed no threat. His name was Umos, and identified himself as the fifth sentinel of the Luminoth race, son of the third sentinel, Vimos, and current guardian of his species. The 600-year-old Umos revealed the story of planet Aether and its people, the Luminoth. In their earliest legends, the Luminoth were said to have been born of the stars themselves. They traveled the void of the universe and met several other spacefaring species of enlightened minds, such as the Nekren, the Ela, the Chozo, and many others. The races shared their knowledge with each other, and each had claimed a homeworld they shared a strong bond with, except the Luminoth. Eventually, they came across the planet Aether, a planet with vast oceans and fields and native gentle creatures. They believed Aether to be so beautiful that they settled the world permanently and built up their civilization in three major areas, mountain ranges, forest, plains. This great temple that Samus found herself in was built in between the three domains, meant to be a monument to their accomplishments. For a time, the Luminoth lived in harmony until they discovered the planet was dying. Aether had an internal flow of planetary energy Energy that held it together. It was becoming unstable, and left unchecked, it would result in the planet's destruction. The brightest minds of the Luminoth came together and devised a plan to save Aether. They created elaborate machines that they called energy controllers. The main one was built inside the Great Temple, and three sub-controllers were built inside temples across the Luminoth's three other regions. Together, the machines collected the energy from within the planet, regulated it, and its power radiated throughout Aether in a process that stabilized the planet. The Luminoth referred to the collected energy as the Light of Aether. They may have saved their own world, but tragedy would again put them in danger of extinction. They were so focused on regulating the light of Aether that they failed to monitor space. By the time they noticed a large object speeding towards their planet, it was too late. The Luminoth took shelter in their dwellings and waited, hoping the planet would survive the impact. They fired weapons at the meteor in an attempt to change its trajectory to no avail. The cosmic object plummeted into the planet with an extreme force. The green plains were scorched, the forests were engulfed by the seas, the sky seemed to be on fire, and Aether was covered in darkness for days. The impact also destabilized the energy controllers, and once again the world became unstable. Connections were already starting to form in Samus's mind. Something bigger was happening on Aether and in the galaxy as a whole. Talon IV was hit by a meteor, and Phazon began spreading quickly, killing the planet. Now Aether was hit with the meteor, and Phazon was also present. But she found it within some kind of dimensional rift, and Umos explained that she had traveled to Dark Aether. The impact of the meteor combined with the destabilization of the planetary energy created multiple dimensional rifts. Objects and the atoms they were made from found themselves shifting between reality and somewhere else. The dimensional rifts were becoming more common, and the Luminoth determined that the impact created a corrupted, toxic version of their planet Two planets occupying the same location, shifting between dimensions and overlapping each other. And then came the war. A brutal new species emerged from the dimensional rifts into Aether. They were called the Ing, the word for terror in Luminoth language. Swarms of insect-like monsters appeared, slaughtering the Luminoth in their path and destroying everything they came across. The negative energy found within Dark Aether also had the ability to enter and possess bodies, even the bodies of the dead. 
the Lumov built machines of their own to open up rifts into Dark Aether, and scouts were sent to investigate the other side. In order to survive its toxic environment, they developed light crystals that formed small barriers of light inside Dark Aether. The scouts discovered a world filled with Ing and energy controllers of their own. The Ing had stolen the light of Aether to stabilize their own world, leaving Light Aether to die slowly. The Luminoth fought a long war against the Ing in an effort to recover the light of Aether, but the numbers of the Ing were vast and they had the power to possess the Luminoth. Friends and family became enemies, loved ones were forced to destroy each other, and every Luminoth soldier was prepared to self-terminate rather than become a weapon of the enemy. Their numbers dwindled, and it was clear that the war was lost. In a last-ditch effort, the Luminoth developed the Energy Transfer Module, a device with a power core fueled by light energy that could absorb the light of Aether and allow it to be transferred into another energy controller. The Luminoth planned a massive attack against Dark Aether in order to steal the light, but no Luminoth survived the battle, and the the energy transfer module was lost, until Samus found it. That was the mysterious light that her suit absorbed. After the battle, the remaining Luminoth gathered at the Great Temple and went into a life-preserving stasis underground. Until solution to the Ing and Dark Aether could be found, Yumos prayed for salvation and Samus arrived, with the energy transfer module that was stolen. Only Samus had the ability to restore Aether. Yumos asked her for help and explained that she would have to search for dimensional rifts and portals to Dark Aether in order to steal back the light from the three Dark Temples and main energy controller. If Aether were destroyed, the creatures of Dark Aether would come into the world of light and spread through the galaxy. They had to be stopped and Samus knew that without her help, the Luminoth would perish. She agreed to assist them. Now Samus understood the history of Aether, the presence of Phazon and Dark Samus was still a mystery. How was it all related? She still had many answers to uncover. Before leaving on her search, Samus asked Yumos about Dark Samus, but he had no helpful information. Dark Samus was very much a mystery to the Luminoth, as well, but he felt it had evil intentions. Samus left to begin her new journey and brief the remainder of Task Force Heracles on the situation. To get off the planet, they needed to save it. The harsh atmosphere of Dark Aether coming in and out of existence would never allow them to leave. Attacks on the Great Temple would surely intensify. As protection for Yumos and all the Luminoth inside, the Marines would stand guard and fight back while Samus did her work. Her first stop, the Aegon Wastes. The Aegon Wastes, also known as the Land of Sand and Ruin, among the Luminoth, was once known as the Aegon Plains. During their golden age of peace and prosperity, Aegon was filled with lush plains stretching out as far as the eye could see. Once the meteor impacted the planet, the region was scorched, filled with creatures that can only survive in such arid, dry conditions. Soon after arriving, Samus detected one of her stolen weapons, her Morph Ball Bombs. Not only could the Darklings possess creatures, they can also absorb weaponry, and this dark-powered sand digger was now capable of generating the same bombs. Although the body was armored, the head and tail were vulnerable to attacks, and it had to be destroyed. With her power bombs reclaimed, Samus went deeper into the Aegon Waste and found the temple where the planetary energy controller waited to be powered on. When Samus arrived, she encountered a hologram of another Luminoth, an AI left behind, of Isha. Isha was the guardian of the Aegon Temple during the war against the Aang, and fell in battle alongside the rest of the Luminoth in the area. But the AI hologram left behind was useful. 
it informs Samus about the dangers of Dark Aether and instructions on how to open the temple in Dark Aether. The temple was sealed and needed three keys in order to open the way towards the Ing Energy Controller. Isha revealed that a nearby portal was available that led directly into Dark Aether. With no time to waste, Samus took the portal into the Dark Aegon Wastes. It was a dark, twisted version of the Aegon Wastes, and the terrain was completely different. The atmosphere was still harmful to Samus' suit, so she had to depend on the Luminoth light barriers for temporary safety. Inside, she encountered powerful Ing warriors, energized by Dark Aether's power, but she also found two secret weapons the Luminoth created to aid them in battle. The Dark Beam was a weapon compatible with Samus' arm cannon that mimicked the dark energy that the Ing used. The Luminoth theorized that its energy could overload the creatures of Dark Aether. The weapon was tested, and it was determined that it only had a minimal effect on the Ing, but it did have the ability to open portals into the Dark Aether. and the Light Beam. With the Light Beam, the Luminoth experimented on the opposite end, and it proved to be a far deadlier weapon. The Ing from Dark Aether were incredibly weak against its powerful beam, made of a charged mass of light energy, and Samus would be able to test out her arsenal on the Jump Guardian, a warrior Ing that was mutated by Samus' stolen space jump boots. With many of her original weapons and systems back online, Samus made her way through the Ing Hordes, Toxic Atmosphere, and found three keys needed to access the Dark Aegon Temple. But the Ing placed safeguards in the temple, knowing that eventually somebody would attempt to steal their planetary energy. beast in front of Samus was a trio of worm-like creatures known as a Morbus that can move effortlessly through solid rock and could sense the location of prey above ground. And Morbus had an incredibly strong hide and was very resistant to pain. But Samus's weapons were powerful enough to bring it down with enough damage. Besides experimental weapons, the Luminoth also worked on new power suits. Destroying a Morbus paved the way to the Luminoth Dark Suit, 
a suit created as a defense to the toxic atmosphere of Dark Aether. It gave Samus additional protection against the dark attacks of the Ing, and it filtered out about 80% of the atmosphere's corrosive effects. Just beyond Amorbus' lair, Samus came upon the Dark Aegon Temple's energy controller, which heavily resembled the one on Light Aether. She activated her energy transfer module and set out to return the Light of Aether to its rightful place. The light of the Aegon Waste was returned, and a portion of the planet began stabilizing. But the Ing still had the majority of Aether's energy, and their forces were aware of the danger that Samus posed. She was successful where armies of Luminoth had failed, and the Ing were moving their warriors to the swamplands of Torvis, the location of the Second Temple. Before the impact of the meteor, the Torvis Bog was a lush forest ecosystem that was weather controlled by the light of Aether. Constant steady rains fed the plant life, and many Luminoth built their homes there. But after the meteor impact, the oceans of Aether completely flooded the region, and when the light of Torvis was stolen, uncontrolled plant growth and non-stop rain ruined the previous forest. Now it was filled with aquatic and reptilian animals that never belonged there, throwing the ecosystem out of balance. Enemies that didn't belong there including space pirates. Samus was prepared to face space pirates since Task Force Heracles had been chasing them all the way to Aether, but these space pirates seemed confused and shocked to see Samus. Unknown to her, the space pirates were dealing with several threats of their own. The Ing saw them as intruders also, but more importantly, they already discovered multiple rifts back and forth to Dark Aether, where they discovered plentiful amounts of Phazon, and they became victims of raids from Dark Samus. But the space pirates were under the assumption that Dark Samus was Samus in a new suit, proclaiming her as the Dark Hunter. Dark Samus only attacked the Space Pirates if they attempted to stop it from collecting Phazon. For them, the situation was quickly derailing. Now, having two hunters to deal with, the Dark Hunter and Samus, the Accursed Hunter. After fighting off the Space Pirate attack, Samus regained the super missiles that were stolen from her and continued searching for the Torvis Bog Temple.
she arrived, another AI hologram of a heroic Luminoth guardian greeted her. This was Avok, a well-educated scribe among his people. Avok also had strong psychic defenses and died after fending off numerous attacks by the Aang to possess him. His AI hologram instructed Samus on the directions to the temple found within the Dark Torvis Bog. Another temple that required three keys to open the way to the energy controller. The way to the Dark Torvis Bog portal was treacherous, but Samus was well armed, even activating a mechanism that returned her arms cannon seeker launcher. Vast underwater sections contained predators intent on devouring any intruders, including packs of blogs, led by an alpha blog, the head of the pack. The blogs were quick underwater slug like creatures capable of firing sonic disruption blasts and had strong jaws. Samus equipped a mechanism for the dark suit that helped her move more efficiently underwater and found the portal leading into the Dark Torvis Bog. She emerged on the other side, and it was just like the dark version of the Aegon Wastes, a completely altered version of the same areas with a toxic atmosphere which Samus was now better equipped to handle. She didn't need to focus on staying within the Luminoth light barriers anymore thanks to her new dark suit. And the Boost Guardian, another Guardian Aang that absorbed Samus' capabilities, became one of her primary targets. With its destruction, her boost ball ability returned, and another Aang known as a Grenchler was mutated by Samus's stolen grapple beam. The mystery of the Phazon presence in Dark Aether remained on her mind. What was it doing there? And it seemed that Phazon was contained inside Dark Aether. Based on her experience on Talon 4, she believed that the impact crater containing the Phazon must have been warped somehow into Dark Aether when the planet started splitting in two. She traveled between Light and Dark Aether searching for the Temple Keys, and the Space Pirate's greatest fears came true. Samus stumbled upon their operation. It was Talon 4 and Project Helix all over again. Though this operation seemed to be in its early stages, they were clearly collecting Phazon again, and that's what Dark Samus wanted. It was absorbing the Phazon and getting stronger with every feeding.
Dark Samus dissipated, but Samus had no doubt that the creature was still alive. She knew Phazon had life-giving and regenerative properties. Space Pirate Scouts secretly watched the encounter between the two hunters and realized that they weren't working together, and that they were two separate individuals. They seemed to be enemies. Perhaps the Space Pirates could cut their losses on Aether and strike a deal with this Dark Samus in the future. Samus was more determined than ever to destroy Dark Aether. If it was destroyed, the Phazon and Space Pirate operation would go with it. With the three temple keys in hand, she returned to the Dark Torvus Temple to unlock the way to the energy controller. But another Guardian would stand in her way. The Chica originated as an enormous larva that was fish-like and moved through the poison waters of Dark Aether, but with enough damage taken, as a defensive measure its body's evolution accelerated and it cocooned itself to emerge as an adult, dragonfly-like Chica. After the Chica's destruction, Samus received the Dark Visor, another item devised by the Luminoth during the war for use on power suits. Originally, it was used by a Luminoth war hero known as Akul in order to penetrate the Dark Haze of Aether. At some point it was stolen, and now Samus reclaimed it, gaining the ability to see the unseen. Objects that weren't visible to the naked eye in a state of interdimensional flux would no longer be hidden. The Dark Taurus Bog Energy Controller no longer had protection. It was time for Samus to return another portion of the Light of Aether.
one more sub-energy controller remained, and what was left of Task Force Heracles still stood strong, protecting the entrance to the Great Temple and keeping Yumo safe. But the Ing were getting desperate, and their forces were becoming more aggressive. Samus had to move quickly to the Luminoth Sanctuary Fortress, an ancient place of study high in the mountains. During the war, the Luminoth converted it into a vast technological stronghold, where weapons were manufactured and machines protected them, overlooking a vast city of light. When Dark Aether was born, the dark version of the Sanctuary Forest was a huge Ing Hive, swarming with Ing warriors. Instead of looking over a city, the Ing Hive overlooks a vast poisonous ocean. Long ago, the Luminoth lost the Sanctuary Fortress to the Ing, and the machines meant to protect them were corrupted by Dark Aether's power, and they turned against their creators. Now the machines would attack any intruder, including Samus. Machines weren't the only threat, however. Space pirates were also in the region searching for more portals into Dark Aether, and more Phazon for their experiments. When Samus found the energy controller within the Sanctuary Fortress, she encountered another AI hologram of a heroic Luminoth Guardian. This one was known as Olir the Sentinel of the Fortress Temple. Olir was the genius Luminoth that invented many of the security robots inside, but he was killed when the machines turned against the Luminoth. The AI expressed sadness that Olir couldn't join Samus in her battle, but provided directions to the Ing Hive portal and their energy controller. On the way to the portal, Samus found another of her missing upgrades, the Spider Ball, which allowed her to cling to walls in Morph Ball mode. It was being held by a mutated Ing Pill Bug, and just beyond, she would go through some delay when Dark Samus reappeared. As expected, the creature was still alive and attempting to delay Samus. Dark Samus must have been detecting more Phazon beyond the portal and craving its raw power. Not even dark-powered space pirates did a chance. Dark Samus was defeated again, but the power of Phazon was flowing strongly throughout its body. Samus had to hurry and find the portal to the Ing Hive before Dark Samus had an opportunity to reform and gain even more power. Her screw attack ability was located nearby, something she needed to increase her maneuverability around Aether, but the weight was blocked by a caretaker class drone. 
It was another mechanical device developed by the Luminoth, meant to use its mechanical limbs to clean and perform maintenance duties. With full mobility and much of her weapon systems back online, Samus traveled into the darkness of the Hive. The Metroids the Space Pirates brought with them from Talon 4 were exposed to Dark Aether's atmosphere and nearby Phazon so deeply that they mutated into another species of Metroid, larger, more aggressive, and able to sustain even more damage. One of her most crucial, still missing weapons was her power bomb, a weapon capable of annihilating the Metroids that attacked her. It was protected by a mutated Sprob, a species of predatory plant life that could grow in walls. And once she collected the three keys necessary to open the Inghive Temple, she came upon the terrifying trap that the Ing had left for her. The ultimate Luminoth security robot, Quadraxis. A colossal security drone reprogrammed to fight for the Ing and powered by the shadows of Dark Aether. The destruction of Quadraxis left behind a powerful weapon, the Annihilator Beam. It was an arm cannon worn by the Luminoth war hero Akul and taken off his body after he was defeated. It was designed to fire antimatter shots powered by both light and dark energy. Incredible power in the palm of her hand. Just beyond the arena, the third portion of the Light of Aether awaited.
The light of Aether from all three sub-temples shone brightly again, further stabilizing Aether, and Eumos used the energy controller to draft another upgrade for Samus' suit, Fusion of Luminoth and Chosa Technology. The final struggle was approaching. The Ing were in disarray, and Eumos revealed who their leader was, a mysterious member of their group known as the Emperor Ing, the oldest and strongest of them all. It resided inside the Sky Temple, the dark version of the very temple that Samus stood inside of, but the entrance to the Sky Temple in Dark Aether was locked by ten hidden keys. Samus had been following clues left behind by the Luminoth war hero Akol and already tracked down nine of them. The final one was already placed on the Sky Temple entrance by Akol himself before he collapsed. Without the knowledge he left behind, the Sky Temple keys may have been lost forever. Before entering the portal leading to the Sky Temple, Samus briefed the rest of Task Force Heracles. The battle was almost over, and they were moments from being able to get back home. But the Emperor Ing was sure to send a full-out assault through the portal to follow Samus. If they worked together, success would be guaranteed. While Samus went inside, Miguel and his troops would set up a defensive perimeter with automated turrets, explosives, and all the remaining ammo they had left. Samus entered the portal, and just as she had predicted, massive hordes of Ing rushed the portal. Task Force Heracles fired with everything they had left, and held them off as best as they could to buy Samus time. When she arrived at the Sky Temple entrance, the Phazon was already growing out of control, just like on Talon 4, and the Temple Keys unlocked the way. The Emperor Ing must have been massive. Its tentacles grabbed the final piece of the Light of Aether, the core of the main energy collector, and carried it through to its main chamber for protection. When Samus arrived in the main chamber, she stood before the leader of the Ing, the Emperor. Samus's scans revealed that this wasn't the Emperor's true form, merely a cocoon meant to protect it from outside attack. But the cocoon was still powerful on its own. It spawned several tentacles that attacked wildly with dark energy. The outer walls of the chamber were surrounded by Phazon. Although the light suit protected Samus from dark energy, Phazon was still a corrosive substance. Eventually, the inner core of the cocoon presented itself, took intense damage, and the Emperor Aang had no choice but to heal itself deeper inside a cocoon. With Samus's full arsenal back in her suit, she could easily see its weakness, couldn't resist the blows from morph ball bombs, and the explosions cracked open the Emperor Aang's defenses, revealing its true final form. the first Aang born after the creation of Dark Aether, and much like the Metroid Prime on Talon 4, the constant Vazon exposure mutated it into a much stronger nightmare, and the Emperor Aang could also wield the powers of both light and darkness, not sharing the same obvious weakness to the light as its brethren. But Samus was an experienced hunter at this point, and she learned from her battle in the Tetra Galaxy against Gorilla. The Emperor Aang continuously switched between light and dark energy in order to attack which left it vulnerable to Samus switching her weapons back and forth.
Sam absorbed the main core of the Light of Aether within her energy transfer module and set out to return to the portal. In moments, the entire planet of Dark Aether would be no more. The Phazon infection combined with the instability of being stuck between two dimensions with no source of planetary energy was too much for Dark Aether to handle. But something was following Samus. Dark Samus took its final stand. More powerful than ever, the Phazon readings coming from the monster were off the charts, and regular attacks seemed to bounce right off of it. And this time, much like the Metroid Prime, it was able to shift in and out of the visual spectrum. Samus's multiple visors had no problem seeing Dark Samus, and Samus remembered her battle with the Metroid Prime. It was mutated by Phazon, but it was also vulnerable to the same energy. If Dark Samus was born from the Metroid Prime's destruction, perhaps it shared the same weakness. Samus decided to absorb the Phazon energy in her arm cannon and send it back to Dark Samus, intending to overload it. The planet was falling apart, Dark Samus was defeated, and the Ing were in a full-blown panic. Samus had to leave immediately. She rushed the portal, reactivated it quickly. Dark Aether was destroyed, and she excitedly emerged on the other side to celebrate with Task Force Heracles, but tragedy would greet her. The final Ing assault was too much, and the team were fatally wounded, lifeless. With the exception of Miguel, Samus removed the rubble from his body and helped him sit up, telling him to hang on. But it was clear that he only had moments left. In his final seconds, he told Samus that they held him off until the end. He looked upon the sky of Aether and saw the light returning. His mission was accomplished. Samus completed her final task and returned the light of Aether to the main unit. The planet was saved and the Ing expressed their gratitude to their armor-clad savior. Before leaving, she returned Luminoth technology to them and departed after an exhausting journey between two worlds. In the days following Samus' successful mission, Yumos awakened the rest of the Luminoth and its people celebrated the bright sky they missed so fondly. Their species would quickly recover over time and new young Luminoth would hear the tales of the heroes that saved their world, the legendary Samus Aran and the four Galactic Federation Marines that gave their lives for them. Aether may have been at peace, freed of space pirates, shadow creatures, and Phazon, but the threat it faced were only a prelude to the dangers facing the rest of the galaxy. Something had survived the destruction of Dark Aether.
Join me next time for the Metroid Timeline Part 6, Galaxy at War. The Space Pirates are reorganized as an extremely effective fighting force and attack the Galactic Federation on multiple fronts, while Samus answers the call to fight on the front lines. But enemies from her past join forces under one banner and new leadership in order to stop her once and for all. And the origins of the mysterious Phazon are at least revealed, in a plot that threatens to destroy every planet in the galaxy.